Hello, I'm Dan Sweet. I'm Director of Public Relations and Communications for Helicopter Association International, and welcome to HAI at Work, our weekly webinar series. Today, we are going to be a little bit uh, early in celebrating Teacher Appreciation Week, uh, which is the first week of May. And we have a great selection today with uh, John and Martha King and our Salute to Excellence Flight Instructor of the Year. We'll get started in just a minute. Uh, we just wanna give everybody a time to join in, please. That probably is about enough time to uh, give people to join. We know that people will uh, come and go as their schedule permits. As I mentioned, uh, we are going to be celebrating teachers today, uh, flight instructors most specifically. We have our Salute to Excellence 2022 Flight Instructor of the Year Award with us today. And of course, we have John and Martha King, who are about as well known in flight instruction circles and in aviation as you can possibly get. Uh, now that I've talked about them, let's introduce them. Uh, Scott Tennyson is the lead flight instructor and an experimental test pilot for Boeing's Vertical Lift Division. He's a former AH-1 Cobra and AH-64 Apache pilot and test pilot uh, for, the, excuse me, for the U.S. Army. He was an instructor pilot and test pilot for Grown Brothers Aviation and a helicopter air ambulance pilot before joining Boeing. And we have John and Martha King. Uh, I think everybody is uh, very familiar with both of them. John and Martha started teaching uh, aspiring pilots in the early 1970s and founded King Schools in 1975. When they decided to record and sell their, lesson, sell their lessons, they changed the face of flight instruction. Our webinars are interactive. We do encourage you to ask questions today. Um, just like uh, being in the schoolhouse, you're always uh, allowed to ask the teacher questions. Please use the question module that's at the bottom or the side of your uh, monitor, your screen. We do follow the chat uh, feature, but uh, the questions are the ones that we will use at the uh, end of the webinar to address the questions you've submitted. We'll do our best to get every uh, question in. Our webinars are being recorded. We will make the uh, recording link available as soon as possible. That might be tomorrow afternoon. That can be Monday afternoon as well. It depends on how quickly things get rendered. We do appreciate your patience with that. So now I'd like to introduce uh, Scott Tennyson. Uh, Scott was the, uh, Scott, please turn on your camera and your microphone, join us. Scott is the 2022 recipient of the WA Dub Blessing Salute to Excellence Flight Instructor of the Year Award. That's sponsored by uh, Hill Air. Scott, welcome to uh, our At Work webinar. Thank you, Dan, happy to be here. Uh, Scott, how did you first get the flying bug? I think like a lot of young people, uh, seeing airplanes and helicopters as a child, it looks exciting and, and you know, you've got the movies and the books you read and everything. Um, so it's always kind of present, I think, uh, or was always present within me. Uh, as I started growing older, you know, when you start thinking about the future and, and what can be accomplished, uh, there's obviously a financial outlay that usually accompanies flight training. Uh, it's one of the more expensive things you can choose to do, I find. Um, I think the big jump for me was when I realized that there was a path forward for me to learn how to fly. Uh, you know, our family didn't have a lot of money and, and I certainly didn't have the, uh, the wherewithal myself to, to start flying. So um, after a, a short uh, investigation and in, in learning about uh, Army ROTC, uh, I, I was able to uh, earn and, and win a scholarship to the University of North Dakota where I began my flight training. Well, can you tell me about uh, your, your flight career as you got started? Yeah, um, so my first flight ever, uh, I was actually a teenager. A lot of folks get to fly when they're really young and get the bug. Uh, I was always interested, but didn't actually get up in an aircraft until like, my teens. Um, at the University of North Dakota, uh, still a very grand and large school, uh, at the time, I think they were really the focal point of aviation training and being one of the first schools that had 
uh, from my perspective, an army program where you could actually uh, apply scholarship funds to flight training. That wasn't the case everywhere. So uh, I started out again, my private airplane license uh, at the school and then moved straight to helicopters, worked my way through all the ratings there. And then it's interesting in my point from a flight instructor perspective, because the normal step for most folks then is to get your flight instructor rating and get a job and build hours. For me, because I, I selected the ROTC scholarship, it's time to go active duty and pay back Uncle Sam. So essentially, uh, I went to Army Flight School. Uh, that's why I flew the Cobra and Apache, and I flew Apaches for eight years. Uh, and it wasn't until after I got out of the Army, and I'd already been a, an aviator for about 10 years, counting my, my college time, that I became a flight instructor. Had you always planned to become a flight instructor or is that something that just you fell into naturally or how did that work for you? I think it, I think I fell into it naturally. When I got out of the military, uh, I then also had a question if I'd be able to, to fly for a living. I didn't have a whole lot of flight time. I was a commissioned officer in, in back in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, you know, the Warren Officer Corps does most of the flying, obviously, in, in, in the Army. Uh, so not every job you have as a commissioned officer is a flying position. So your flight hours aren't that robust when you don't do a full career in the military. So after eight years, I almost had enough hours to, to get in the market. I was close. Uh, and when I started working at Grown Brothers, uh, the opportunity to you know, start training customer pilots came up. And uh, one, of my, one of my mentors, Terry Brandt, uh, really, really opened my eyes to you know, how much impact a flight instructor can have um, and, and really how great it is to help somebody learn how to fly and to work through the challenges and so on. So I became a flight instructor uh, post army and then have acquired several other flight instructor ratings since then and uh, flight instructor this day. Well, how can you describe your current role as both a test pilot and an instructor pilot for Boeing? Sure, yeah, so here at Boeing in Mesa, you know, we, we manufacture all, all the Apache helicopters in the world right here, um, including Little Birds, the H-6 aircraft. Um, a lot of us have joint roles. Or I shouldn't say joint roles, but multiple roles. And so the bread and butter of this, of this uh, Boeing plant here is obviously to build and sell Apaches to customers, be it the U.S. government or foreign governments. Uh, along with that comes often training the customers. So if a customer, excuse me, if a foreign country, for example, uh, chooses or selects one of our aircraft, uh, obviously they need to get trained. So the initial key personnel get trained and they'll often come here to Boeing to do that. Uh, but most of our time actually is spent testing the aircraft. And so it could be uh, as simple as a, a in installation of a new or upgraded radio all the way through to new air, airframe, uh, or even rotor blade designs, things of that nature. So uh, the day in the life here is really exciting. Uh, one day I may be doing some flight instruction, another day I could be in Apache doing a flight tests, and then the next day I could be uh, in a support aircraft chasing a Chinook test. So it's, uh, it's pretty good. That does sound intriguing. Yeah. You, you spend what appears to be a significant amount of time giving back to others in the community or in the industry. Can you talk about this and why it's important for you? It's, uh, first I'll tell you why it's important. Um, when, when you obtain and, and achieve things that you never dreamed of before, thanks to mentors, and, and those mentors happen to be flight instructors in my world. Uh, Rich Lee, uh, I've, I've mentioned him before, and uh, Terry Brandt and many, many others. When, you see how their impact on your life results. You can't but not want to help others achieve their dreams when you finally have the ability to, to help them, uh, be it in a mentoring role or a flight instruction role. So I think it's paying it forward. I know that's a, a phrase used a lot and, uh, and so on and so forth, but, but really that's what it is, is, is the drive to help others hopefully achieve their dreams like others have helped you achieve. And, and, it, and it's something you don't plan to do or talk about, it occurs. And, and uh, interestingly enough, but not surprisingly, uh, many of the folks that I've helped, but that I've helped uh, throughout the years are now doing the same thing to others. And so it's, it's a great, great uh, 
mode of, of, of helping and assistance. That's awesome. Um, is there ever been one piece of advice that you received from an instructor that really stuck with you and, and what that might, what would that be? And then um, do you share that with your student, students currently? You know, there's really so many things. It's, it's hard to identify probably the greatest one. Um, one thing that I've, I've kind of said lightheartedly, but it's very true, uh, and, and this you can apply this to the PTS or the ACS or just general knowledge. When you learn to fly and you study everything you need to study and you do your ground schools and your flight training, um, it, and I know it's been called, you know, your, your private pilot, even the commercial, that's really just a, a ticket to learn, to continue learning. Uh, the learning does never end. And I've told people at the end of check rides, I'll be sitting with applicants and instructors, uh, you know, no matter what the outcome is, and I'll say, I've, I've got to be honest with you. I thought I understood a great amount of what we did when I was a pilot and an army pilot. When I became a flight instructor, I kicked it up a notch and I started to realize things that, you know, weren't even evident to me uh, as a pilot. And this is even after a commercial career. Um, then when I become a designated examiner and really had to understand the regulations and the learning, uh, you know, how humans learn and it's all the things that go along with it, it really opened my mind. And so I, I share that with, with everybody that I meet. It's, it's don't, don't ever stop learning. When, when I finish a CFII check ride, you know, it's usually the last check ride a student will take after a long course, they're ready to get their first job. I always tell them, you know, don't stop. You should celebrate that you finally passed and you're done and you're ready to go off and start your flight instructing job or your tour job, whatever it is. But you've got to stay involved because there's still way more for you to learn. I'm still learning now after 35 years. Um, so yeah, just it, you never stop learning. You have to keep your mind open all the time. I, I like that. That's uh, refreshing to hear an instructor you know, acknowledge that learning just never stops. Uh, Scott, let's uh, take a couple of minutes. Um, as part of your Salute to Excellence Award, uh, we prepare a video that we share that uh, describes your accomplishments. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen again, and we will watch uh, your video. Helicopter Association International proudly presents the Salute to Excellence WA Dub Blessing Flight Instructor of the Year Award, sponsored by Hill Air. This award acknowledges superlative contributions by a flight instructor in upholding high standards of excellence. Scott Tennyson got to where he is today thanks to mentors who supported him along his journey. That's why the Boeing Company flight instructor and experimental test pilot who has 33 years of accident-free flying experience, is dedicated to giving back to others. Scott remembers wanting to be a pilot, but questioning the feasibility of achieving his dream. When he discovered the U.S. Army's ROTC program at the University of North Dakota, that dream became possible. Upon graduation from UND, Scott attended Army Flight School to become an AH-1 Cobra and AH-64 Apache pilot. After eight years of service, he entered the civilian world as an instructor pilot for gyroplane manufacturer Grone Brothers Aviation. Scott thrived at Grone. Not only did he have the opportunity to teach customers to fly, but he mentored them in their careers as well. After leaving Grone, Scott took a helicopter EMS position. Then, in 2011, he landed what has been a dream job in Boeing's vertical lift division. There, he trains domestic and international pilots and conducts experimental test flights in the AH-64E Apache, the A-MH-6M, and the AH-6 Little Bird. Scott's experience at Boeing wouldn't be the same without his own mentor in the organization, Rich Lee, chief developmental test pilot for Rotorcraft. Rich took Scott under his wing and supported his rise in the company. He also encouraged Scott to become a designated pilot examiner, or DPE. All he asked in return was that Scott pay it forward. Scott's love of learning, teaching, and all things aviation is an inspiration to those around him. Please join the HAI Board of Directors in saluting Scott Tennyson, recipient of the 2022 Salute to Excellence WA Dub Blessing Flight Instructor of the Year Award. 
Scott, please allow me to, on behalf of the board and Hilaire and HAI's uh, management, offer my congratulations for the award. Um, obviously, it was well deserved. Uh, your mentor, Rich Lee, was uh, your uh, the person who nominated you and recognized uh, your amazing efforts to uh, assist others in your career. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's, it's been the most wonderful experience. Okay, if I've, I hate to do this, we'll ask you to mute your camera and microphone for just a few minutes and we'll invite uh, John and Martha King on and then we'll bring everybody back together again at the end for the question and answer period. John and Martha, welcome to HEI at Work webinar. We are so pleased to have you today. It's a delight to be here, Dan. Thank, Thank you, you very man. much. Scott, I'm jealous. If, if I didn't know you had the pre-flight airplanes in North Dakota, I'd be really jealous. <laughs> John, Martha, can you tell us, how, how did you uh, walk us through, please, how you started your, uh, flight, your video flight instruction business? Well, we're, we're really uh, ground instructors. And, and if, uh, you have to explain to someone who's not familiar with aviation what a ground instructor is, but that's what we are. We, we, we do a little flight instruction, but we're really ground instructors for a living. And uh, we started doing what we called weekend ground schools. And, and the year would have been, what, about uh, 75. 75. We started week doing weekend ground schools. And what we would do is we'd take a, 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 a rural area like Billings, Montana, and the, the people who flew around in that area flew out in little communities and had to go to, to uh, seven day ground, uh, seven, seven week ground schools. And they would have to come in from the country uh, to attend a ground school, um, uh, generally several, what, seven, seven weeks, weeks for, for seven, seven weeks. weeks. And they're driving kind of back and forth all over Montana to do that. And we said, look, we'll, we'll set up a ground school, a weekend ground school, and we'll, we'll do your ground school in one weekend. And the people would all come in and, and they would spend over the night in the hotel and their, they'd bring their kids with them and everybody would be partying. And, and the, parent, the, the, the fathers were, generally the fathers were in there doing ground school and all of the kids and family were with them and we'd do it all in one weekend. And then at the, at the, we do ground school on Saturday and then Sunday. And then on uh, Monday, the FA would come in and we'd give them the test. That was back in the day when the written exams really were written on actual uh, paper with pens. And uh, uh, the, the FA would come in and pass all the test books out and the answer sheets and uh, proctor it uh, themselves. And... Um, uh, we learned a lot from that uh, teaching. Uh, we were doing it uh, pretty much every weekend uh, for 10 years, as John says. And when you're trying to get it done in a weekend, you very quickly learn if you have started a topic on the wrong foot because if you're if you're up in front of a classroom talking and you have a, a whole classroom full of glazed eyes staring back at you, you know who the idiot is and it's not the people out there in the chairs in front of you. So so we we learn to get into the topics efficiently and clearly and uh, and to make it fun so that uh, they would remember it because they only had two days and uh, it had to stick with them at, at least through the knowledge test they written at that time. And, uh, and hopefully uh, through their check rides and, and into their actual flying careers. We had to get a seven week ground school done in two, in two days. And uh, so you, you couldn't afford to get started off backwards and all confused. Uh, so, so that was perfect preparation. We had uh, one of John's relatives and uncle went to the ground school classes with us after we'd been doing them for about 10 years. And at the end of the uh, weekend, he said to us, you know, you should put these uh, programs on video. And I said, that just goes to explain that you don't understand how our business works. It, it, won't, it won't work on video because it requires our personal dynamic presence there. And if we don't have our personal dynamic presence, it's not gonna work. And uh, so we didn't put it on video and we're the ones that didn't understand how it worked. We but put it on but he, kept, on. he kept saying to us, how do you know it's not gonna work if you never tried it? And so he finally wore us down and we put a couple of segments of the uh, weekend seminars on video and used them to instruct the students and the students loved it. 
because we could do things on video that you can never do in a portable stand-up classroom that changes every weekend from one hotel meeting room to another. Um, video of aircraft parts of things happening, well, all kinds of stuff that really helped with the knowledge. They didn't even have to come into a hotel to see John and Martha. They just put us in a box and ship us to their living room. Right. And we'd, we'd teach them in their living room. And, and that was the beginning of video. And um, video really made aviation accessible to people in a way that it wouldn't have otherwise. It, and when yeah. you speak video, that was VHS. Yeah. And there will be some people listening who probably don't even know what VHS yeah. is. And some of them were beta. There was a beta, yeah. beta yeah. versus VHS argument. But, but what it did is it made it accessible to them when they wanted it, where they wanted it. And, and it, it multiplied the number of people who could quickly learn to fly. And, and that... that changed aviation and to a great extent. It certainly changed our lives. Well, how has your training changed since you began? Are the changes mostly technological or have there been other changes over the course of the years? No, it's, it's far more than technological. One of the things that, um, that we began to realize is we, we got feedback from our students and saw what they were being asked on the test. And the things that were causing accident weren't the things that the FA was asking on the test. And, and uh, so we began to realize that the things that are causing accidents are not failures on skills. Those days, um, the, when they tested a new pilot, they tested them for skills and um, people were failing to identify and mitigate risks. And, and, and we decided that, uh, that the FAA kind of had it wrong. We were focusing on skills. We we're fo focusing on a lot of trick questions on a knowledge test. And people were doing things that were fail failures to identify uh, the risks that they're taking. And we were, we were taking those same risks. We did a lot of really incredibly uh, dumb thing in our early days of flying. Uh, we, we had a, a generator fail in an aircraft and, uh, and decided to turn off all the electrical system and just uh, dead reckon until we got to the other end and turned on the batteries and, and everything was uh, dead. Uh, and so we wound up doing a, 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 a descent through the clouds and breaking out underneath to, to uh, uh, try and get down. And um, as it worked out, the, the, the ground wasn't there when we got there. It was, uh, uh, it was low ceilings, no visibility. It was a freezing rain uh, event going on at the time. They had a freezing rain rainstorm. And uh, so we wound up with a, the airplane was a clump of ice and we broke out and landed in a field. Uh, uh, so it was a really scary operation. We, we didn't have a good understanding of the risk we were taking. And, and much of the aviation community was not very risk uh, or, uh, uh, oriented. And uh, I, think, I think we have, are, are doing a better job now of identifying risks in aviation. And, and uh, I hope that we've had some influence on that. You are both known and it's, it's already pretty obvious. Uh, you're known for your senses of humor in your courses. Does keeping the tone lighter uh, help a student to learn or retain? Uh, we have felt ever since we started doing the live two-day ground schools that, that working appropriate humor into our courses made a huge difference on how well people uh, remembered things, learned them and remembered it, uh, always making sure that we weren't just funny to be funny, but that we were, we had humor of one sort or another to help people remember something. It's always been our philosophy to want to support the learning with the humor, and and, and it has to illustrate a point, not distract, not detract from it. Talk so, about the antenna, John. Well, we we have a deal where we 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 tell a student here's an antenna, and the number beside the top of the tower tells you how far, um, what your altimeter is gonna read. If you happen to hit the top of the tower, it tells you what your altimeter would read. And the little number in parentheses tells you how far the airplane is gonna to fall to hit the ground. Uh, so that, that helps people remember what those two numbers besides the antenna are. The, uh, the big number tells you what your altimeter is gonna read and the small number tells you how far you'll fall to the ground. They'll remember that for the rest of their lives. But we want the humor to support uh, the learning, uh, not to detract from it or slow it down or distract from it. Well, you, you mentioned this a little bit. Of, you mentioned this a little bit already. What's the role of a flight instructor in developing a safety culture for the students? 
Well, the flight instructor has a huge role from several standpoints. Uh, one is as a, a an example, and, and the other is as a um, um, as an instructor, a, a mentor, if you will. Um, the, the, the aviation community is moving towards scenario-based instruction. And the scenario uh, puts what they're learning in context so that it fits in with why they're learning it and, and what, they're, what they're doing. And then, um, uh, and then it helps, puts it in place for you to remember it and utilize it. And so um, uh, just the, the, it's the instructor's job to put all this in context and help them develop the habits. Uh, risk management is all about habits. And if they have the habit of identifying the risks and mitigating them, uh, they'll probably keep that habit. And so that's the instructor's job is to develop that habit. That's the instructional role. And the example role is to make sure uh, that they follow those habits also, because a student who, even if properly instructed and thoroughly instructed about risk uh, identification and mitigation, if they don't see their flight instructor doing that, they're gonna say, okay, I have to know this for the test, but nobody does it in the real world, so I won't do it either. And in, in when we first started flying, we kind of felt that the, the identification of uh, risk and safety was all lecturing. And um, and it it, 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 it it was it had a, talk, a talking down to your tone to it. And, and uh, if, but if you were a real pilot, you wouldn't um, you just know this uh, through the pores of your skin somehow. I guess I, I don't know. Yeah. So I think we're as a community. I believe we're doing a much better job of putting it in scenario and and uh, and identifying risks as habits. And as as far as we're concerned, um, risk management is not no no go. Uh, can we accomplish what we want to do uh, more safely? And can we do it more appropriately? Can we change what we're trying to do so that we don't take the risks? Can involved? we mitigate something? As John says, change something to to make the risk an acceptable level instead of an unacceptable level. But it's, it's not a case of you can't go. It's a case of how can you do this uh, more safely and how can you do it by mitigating the risks? Um, do you, uh, uh, that leads me to ask, do you think we are more comfortable as an industry talking about uh, the risks and using examples, personal examples of you know, mistakes that have been made uh, to help illustrate uh, these techniques, uh, these, uh, these issues as we... I think we're far more comfortable as an industry talking about it than we used to be. Um, when John and I got into aviation in 1969, 1970, um, People said, don't talk about risk, don't talk about accidents, because you'll scare off people. And people, uh, uh, newcomers to the community won't want to learn to fly because you'll scare them if you talk about this kind of stuff. But we had a very good friend here in San Diego who started learning to fly. Uh, she was doing some work with us. And, and I guess it rubbed off a little bit, but she started learning to fly and then she quit. And John and I sat down and said, you were doing so well, why is it that you quit? And what she said was really enlightening because what she said was, I'm a scuba diver, I ride horses, I ski, all of these activities tell me up front that what I'm doing is potentially dangerous and has the possibility to kill me. When I go in to fly, they say, oh, don't worry, it's perfectly safe. She said, I'm an intelligent person and I know better than that. I know it's not safe. What they're not doing in aviation, now this was a number of years ago, but what they're not doing in aviation, she said, that I'm having happen in the other activities that I do is they're not teaching me specific tools to help identify and mitigate the risk. Not exactly the words she used, but that was ex exactly what she was expressing. Mm -hmm. And she said, if I'm not gonna get taught that stuff, we weren't instructors yet. If I'm not gonna get taught that stuff, 
I'm not going to continue the activity because I know they're not making me as competent a pilot as I should be. Years ago, Martha and I got in difficulty uh, with the aviation community by coming out with an article called The Big Lie. And what we did is we revealed The Big Lie. And The Big Lie is people would talk around, around, around the airport as they'd say, the most dangerous part of the trip is the drive to the airport. And one of the things that we were, we had gone over the statistics for driving and for flying, and it wasn't true. You're seven times more likely to be involved in a fatality in a general aviation airplane than you are in a car per mile. Now, that yeah. statement is true regarding commercial airline service, but in no way was it true regarding general aviation. So we got in trouble because it, we, we thought, everybody thought we were making the aviation community look bad. Um, but the fact is, when, when you tell the truth and it's credible and people believe it, um, it looks better, uh, as Martha was just pointing out, that if, if someone doesn't feel like we're being realistic about the risks, that they're not comfortable about it. So it's our job to identify that through our risks and to develop mitigation strategies, but uh, we don't want to deny the risks. And, and so what was happening at that time, the most dangerous uh, part of the trip was the drive to the airport. People were in denial about the risks and, and it's not realistic and it's not gonna get good results. So I think we're far better off now that we're willing to, to admit that there are risks and talk about how we're gonna mitigate them. And there is more of that conversation in the community now than there used to be. Have you seen any other significant shifts in how flight training has been conducted since you began teaching others? Well, a big factor John mentioned was uh, that it's now much more focused on scenario-based training and a better understanding of uh, why you're doing maneuvers. Um, when I learned to fly, uh, you did um, turns around a point just because it was a maneuver that the FA required you to display on the test. And nobody really said, well, this is, this is something that if you don't know how to do it right, you could get in trouble with if you're circling around your house trying to wave to your parents or your grandparents or something like that. I Maybe mean, your girlfriend, what do you think? Well, yeah, could be, but could be. So um, now there's much more uh, relating of the reason you're doing this maneuver is because it's important in order to be able to do and then they name something that's actually a part of the real world flying so that, um, so that it doesn't just seem like a, 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 a check the box exercise, but this is something you wanna know to be able, uh, for one thing, to have fun flying. We, we've had a landmark change in the aviation community uh, going from the practical test standards, which only required skills, to the airman certification standards, which required the pilot to demonstrate knowledge and to have standards for the knowledge so that they just couldn't make up things about the knowledge and also risk management. And now we're requiring for the first time in the aviation community, we're requiring new pilots to be able to identify and mitigate risks. We've never required that before. We were testing them for skills, but not for ability to identify and mitigate risks. That's a landmark change. And, and the fact that we're requiring knowledge that's in context so that the FA is not now making up uh, things like how, how many satellites are in the, in the component of satellites and so on. That we're, we're now requiring people to know things about their ability to be a better uh, ma mitigator of risk, a better pilot command. And we're requiring them to be a better pilot command as a result of it. So we're doing a far better job uh, of helping the pilot be a pilot command by requiring them the ability, the ability, the of them the ability to identify and mitigate risk. And that's a landmark change that the community has done. Now, when we first uh, started really pushing um, the evaluation of risk management on the check rides, a, a complaint and objection that came up a lot right in the very beginning initially was that, well, uh, the, the mitigation strategies are going to be different for every uh, check right applicant, depending on their background, the airplane they're flying, the kind of air, uh, flying they're going to be doing, and so on. But the point is that the risk management and mitigation that the designated examiners are evaluating is not the answer, but the process. 
does this applicant have a process where they are able to look at the flight scenario that I as a DPE have given them and tell me what the potential hazards are and what they would do in real life to, to mitigate those. What we're asking for is people have the ability to demonstrate that they're able to be product command. And and that's, how you, that's how you be product command. To have a habit of looking at every flight, identifying potential hazards, identifying any mitigations that would be helpful, and then following those mitigations. That's what a pilot command does. And that's what we're asking people to do. Uh, and I, I think it's a landmark improvement in the aviation community. Are there any areas of flight training that you think still need more emphasis? I would say that, that there always needs to be more emphasis deeper into the uh, flight training community on the whole issue of um, risk management and scenario-based training. Uh, scenario-based training takes a little longer, but it does a much better job, a little longer per flight lesson, but it does a much better job with a, uh, a learning pilot of relating the exercises that they're doing to the real world and what they need to be doing. And it is, it's easy for an instructor who um, for an instructor who is rushed and busy to give short shrift to the whole scenario based training and and risk identification component of the flight training what you're saying is don't neglect the fact that they need to teach them how to be pilot commands really Correct. what you're saying exactly uh, they don't not, want to just, not just physically demonstrate skills but you also want to be able to demonstrate to your pilot command right because the dpe on the check ride is absolutely going to put that student through a whole risk management exercise and if the instructor has not done an, uh, been a mentor for the uh, learning pilot in that way and, and help them find their way to a, a process that works for them, uh, they're going to have trouble when they get to the check right. We're, we're, also, and in life. we're also giving new pilots, all pilots, the, the ability to get weather information, navigation information, so much more information, uh, both in your living room before you go and in your aircraft when you fly than we used to have. And that's a huge it's change. Huge. Uh, one of the issues that has come along, of course, with all of the tablets in the aircraft is in the flight training community, it's a hot question. Do you allow a learning pilot to use a tablet in the cockpit, to use an app like ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot or, or another? And uh, if you do, when do you allow it? Mm -hmm. And some people say, don't allow it, they need to get all the basics down first. But the problem with that approach is, the minute that they've passed their private pilot check ride and they have the ability to go out on their own, if they own a tablet with one of those aviation apps, guess where it's gonna be on their first flight after the check ride? It's gonna be in the cockpit with them and they're gonna be using it. And if the instructor has not help to educate them about the, the distraction possibility and the, uh, the issues, risk management issues of it, as well as the potential benefits of it, then um, the, the instructor has failed that pilot. In, in my view, that's one of the primary obligations of a flight instructor now is to help them be able to use the current resources that are available, right. and take full advantage of them. And that's an obligation that instructor has. Another big thing that has happened pretty recently is the FAA has now said that there is no such thing as an official uh, weather briefing. And they have put out an advisory circular and a lot of research, uh, resources that say to pilots, um, if you want to brief on uh, an app on your tablet, if you want to go online to the National Weather Service, uh, all of these are fine. You just need to make sure that you cover this, these general concepts. And they are now officially considering uh, flight service to be a 
consultative service for you've self-briefed yourself, but you still have questions as opposed to, well, I wonder what the weather's going to be. I think I'll call flight service. Well, the today. idea, in my view, is it's not the it's not the FAA's obligation to see the pilot gets the weather. It's the pilot's obligation to see that they understand the, the circumstances they're going to be flying in. Right. Well, you might have already answered this question a little bit uh, regarding tablets and things, but how has technology influenced uh, aeronautical decision making and, and does this affect training in any, in any other ways? Uh, obviously, the more resources you have in the cockpit uh, uh, and for your flight planning on the ground before you go, uh, the better risk management you're going to be able to do. And with ADSB in so available in so many different ways now, one of the real advantages is that once you're in the air, uh, you don't have to depend on a weather briefing that's an hour old, two hours, three hours old. You've got the ability to call up the weather on your route at your destination look at pilot reports, look at uh, turbulence information, uh, icing forecasts while you're in the air and as it changes and, and on a next red on, on your tablet. And um, the instructor's responsibility is among all their others is to teach the learning pilot how and when to use these resources to best advantage. There's more to learn than there used to be. There a are lot more, more to learn and, and more distractions because of it. it. It's very easy these days to go head down in the cockpit between a tablet uh, on a kneeboard or, or even mounted somewhere or the glass cockpits, the G1000 and so on. Very easy to go head down in the cockpit and not make, pay much attention to what's happening out the window. Do you monitor other trends that are going on in the industry? Uh, you know, maybe accidents or technology and do you leverage that into your training courses? We try to. Uh... I, I think I think there's so much exciting going on now. Um, Martha mentioned NEXRAD, which is of course a, a conglomeration of radars, which gives us tremendous capability of knowing what's going on all around the country. And I think people need to be knowledgeable about more things than they used to be. So we try to, all of this is learning, all of it's much more available than it used to be. And I think we need to learn to take advantage of it. What we do, of course, is um, in addition to John and I, we have other people in the company that are watching all of the newsletters and the articles written by pilots, the stuff that comes out from the FAA to pick up on any upcoming changes and um, either new or modified information so that we can incorporate those into our courses as quickly as possible so that uh, what people get, uh, our courses now, we, we've gone from VHS uh, videotape, which came and went since we've been in this business, uh, to being completely online or downloadable to a tablet. And what, what our goal is, and our promise, is that the courses will always be up to date with whatever the current procedures are, the current FAA regulations and so on. So uh, we have a big obligation to watch that and incorporate it into our training programs as quickly as we can. I uh, was sitting behind you in one of the general sessions at uh, Heli Expo and I noticed you had your tablet out uh, maybe during a slow period. So I think you were keeping up on uh, what was going on around the industry at that time? Oh, we're certainly trying to. <laughs> Excuse me. This uh, question uh, came from one of our HAI staff members. He said that I once read that your early uh, flying journeys and experiences were high excitement and high risk. Perhaps you didn't think at that time about risk mitigation, which you kind of addressed already. Did you ever experience an aha moment that led to a behavior change resulting in what we know today as the King Training Courses. Absolutely, I alluded earlier to the fact we landed um, uh, after having 
gone through a, an overcast and found uh, found not via fire. We just found uh, that we got, broke out of the clouds underneath and landed immediately as we got underneath the clouds. And uh, you might say is that as a result of that, it scared us and we became what we call born again pilots. Uh, that we 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 became aware. Uh, of and how incredibly stupid we can be. We weren't fully aware of that. It took us a while to learn that. And, and, and that we were, uh, we were not uh, willing to accept the idea it was risky activity. We, we like a lot of people who, uh, one, of the, one of the great things about a pilot is that they um, become pilots because they complete what they set out to do. They set goals and they, and they put great effort into it and they learn and become a pilot. And, and, and that you would think would be a good sign of character. But, but one of the problems pilots have is they're very reluctant to give up on a goal. And uh, they're not, they don't want to give up on things that they, they want to accomplish what they set out to do and they don't want to give up on it. And we had that problem. I'm, I'm trying to make it sound really saint-like. Like, uh, saint -like. Um, and, and we weren't for saint like, but we had the problem that if we wanted to do something, we didn't want to give up on a goal. And it took us a while to realize that we were going to have to give up on some goals. And, and it took us a while to realize that we weren't immortal. Correct. We didn't realize that, that it was a risky activity, just walking around. And, and in particularly if you get in an airplane and fly around, it's, or an aircraft of any sort and fly around, it's a risky activity. And so we, we had people trying to warn us, and we took it as a... Um, um, we were averse to being warned. We, we didn't like the idea of anybody telling us they couldn't do something. And I, that's, a, that's in a characteristic, I, I'm going to make it sound like we're achieving people. It's in a characteristic of, of people who have the habit of getting things done is they don't give up on goals. And uh, well, part of what we didn't like was the vocabulary, because people would say to us, you're not making smart decisions. You don't know how to make good uh, aeronautical decisions. And that's not very good guidance. We have, we have developed a philosophy from things like that and over the years uh, of interaction with people of um, you, you have to make sure you use a vocabulary that is acceptable to the listener. And well, we can't blame other people because they use the wrong vocabulary, but we can say what we learned from it is we need to focus on vocabulary. Right. And, and there are some vocabularies that get through more easily to very goal-oriented people than other vocabularies. If they say you exercise poor judgment, you might have exercised poor judgment, but what's the guidance? How do, how do I do what a better do job? Uh, what, what do I need to change? And so that's why we like the, the terminology of risk management. You know, if you tell me I need to identify the risks and mitigate them, I have guidance. I know what I'm supposed to do. If you tell me I'm a failure at aeronautical decision making, I don't know how to fix it. Um, uh, or I'm a failure at aeronautical judgment. I don't know how to fix it. So I think that we need to improve our vocabulary and we'll get better results out of people. Uh, let me ask, finish by asking the uh, question that I asked to uh, Scott uh, a few minutes ago. Is there a bit of advice that either you received as a flight instructor or you've learned to give as flight instructors that really sticks with you that uh, you believe everybody should hear? Well, one of the things uh, that I would say is I agree totally with what Scott was saying about even if you have just finished your, your instrument instructor check ride, keep learning one way or another, keep learning. That's been something that John and I have enjoyed enormously. And it's one of the things that we have recognized in our case anyway, where what we learned in, in one type of aircraft uh, has really contributed to our being able to uh, more competently and, and, and better fly different types of aircraft. For instance, um, we have both seaplane ratings and uh, we're rated in the helicopter. In fact, that picture behind each of us, uh, we took from the, uh, 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 an R-22 south of Paso Robles while John was hovering and I was, I was working the camera on my iPad. 
Um, and the combination of the seaplane rating and the helicopter rating, both of which are done, the flying of which is done off airport a lot and very wind aware, uh, was very instrumental in helping us have the opportunity to learn to fly the Fujifilm airship because they almost never operate on a runway. They need to be extremely wind aware and people with both helicopter and seaplane experience uh, were really um, had the experience they were looking for. And, and that's just one example of how what you learn in one area of aviation, uh, eventually you find it gives you a lot of insight into other areas and that's both uh, productive uh, and just darn fun. It's a lot of fun. It gives you opportunity too. Opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, hey, uh, let's uh, get into some of our audience questions. Uh, Scott, if you're uh, able, can you uh, bring your camera and microphone back up? Awesome, thank you so much. Um, this is one I think I'd like to ask both uh, the Kings and Scott. And this is uh, from uh, viewer Stan, who's uh, one of our regular viewers. Um, how do you find a good, credible instructor and avoid the not so good instructors? Well, for us, um, I'd like to sit down with the instructor before we start and look at the syllabus. And I'd like for him to explain that syllabus to me and how it works and what I'm going to learn where. And, and where we've had, in our cases, where we've had examples of disappointing instructing is the instructor wasn't really following a syllabus and we didn't know where he was going next and what was going to happen after that. So that to me is the number one thing. The instructor needs to be able to explain what they're doing with the syllabus and why they're doing things with the syllabus. The syllabus doesn't 100% guarantee it, but it's a very, very high indicator that the instructor is organized and um, has a system and is using building blocks to get you to to the end where you need to be in an efficient manner. And, and they're thoughtful about what they're doing. And Correct. They're doing. Scott, yeah, I would add to that. Yeah, I would add to that. Um, and this happens a lot uh, as a DPE. Of course, you, you go to many different flight schools and airports and meet a lot of applicants and instructors. And word of mouth is something that definitely is, is very important. Uh, I can't think of how many times folks have come to me and asked, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of getting back. I haven't flown airplanes in 10 years. I want to work on my instrument. Who can you recommend at this airport? And uh, I'll go to my mind. And, and this is the thing about networking that, that's so, so important. And, and we talk about that a lot at, at all our, our meetings at HAI and at, at the expo and stuff. Um, if I don't know somebody at, at Deer Valley, for example, uh, I know people that fly out of Deer Valley and I'll give them a call or somebody that used to work out of Deer Valley and I'll say, hey, give me a couple names of some good airplane CFIs and we'll pass that along. So I uh, can't stress the, the word of mouth. And, and that's, that's a good beneficial thing, too, because if you turn out to be a, a diligent and, and meaningful flight instructor, the word will get out. As, yeah. as a DP, you have access to that very, very strongly. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I think networking throughout our industry is so vital anyway. Um, you never know, you know who you might sit next to in a, uh, an FBO that might one day offer you a job or you know, be a flight instructor with you or something like that. So yeah, networking is, is just an amazing part of our industry. Uh, Gabriel, uh, another one of our longtime viewers had a question. Can you help add to the practical test standards and check rides about the dirty dozen? Uh, I'll just throw that one out there. Do, you, do either of you folks have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, if I understand the question correctly, the, you know, the dirty dozen, I think really focuses on, on human factors um, and this kind of goes back to what both John and Martha were talking about with scenario-based training. Uh, as you know, the helicopter community is still based 100% on the PTS. We still haven't received any ACSs uh, uh, from, you know, from the FAA on their, on their advancement on that project. Um, so if, if a flight instructor sits down with just the PTS and, and their, let's say, 250 hours of flight time experience, um, it can be a challenge and difficult 
ask for them to think of ways to incorporate those type of human factors, uh, things that will help you, I guess, apply that to a scenario. So one of the things I wanted to add real briefly, if we have uh, an extra minute here, is, is the importance of the scenarios is scenario-based training is becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, like John and Martha mentioned, the advancements are already splendid where they're going, but there's still much room for improvement. Um, you know, if, if you took the parallel of, of driving a car and you take a, a person who's old enough to go get their license, it happens to be younger for an automobile, but let's say they happen to do it at 18 years old. Um, could you imagine a group of 18 year olds starting a driving school with 210 hours behind the wheel of a car? And you'd say, how about we get some folks that have been driving a few years that have driven in sleet and rain? And that's not how our industry works. And uh, I'm not here to pick that apart and judge that. But because of that, we have to take that into account. And, and this is where mentoring comes in tremendously is those folks that have the experience need to work with those others. And those instructors need to also need to seek uh, guidance and help whenever they can. Uh, by being involved in things like HAI and, and, and all these other great groups uh, to, to really learn what kind of examples you can give your students to apply uh, the proper scenarios to get through to the student, if that makes any sense. Uh, this one I think would be for both of you, but I think we'll start with Martha because uh, it says, we saw Martha trying out the virtual reality simulators in the uh -huh. HEI Rotor Safety Zone at uh, Heli Expo in Dallas uh, last month. Universities are embracing virtual reality more and more. What are your thoughts on the future of virtual reality and flight training? Well, when I flew the virtual reality simulator at HAI, I was extremely impressed. The, uh, the realism was uh, amazing and um, I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I didn't have time to do the full scenario of you're trying to get from this airport to that airport and there's a mountain range and bad weather in the, in the way and now what are you gonna do? But I, I got to fly the virtual reality, which is a great, uh, that kind of scenario that you had set up at HAI is a great way to train people on uh, evaluating and mitigating risk. And, and I'm just sorry I didn't have more time to work with it. Dan, I'm going to horn in and, and say that one of the questions that always comes in my mind is, so what? Uh, why do we care about virtual reality? And Emory-Riddle Aeronautical University just did an article in Aviation International News. They were the subject of an article in Aviation International News. And they came out with some very, very impressive numbers is that the students learned about 28% faster. Uh, they had less anxiety. Um, they uh, uh, did a better job with ATC. Um, the, the performance of the students, there were their big numbers on the performance of the students were better. And it, uh, you know, Emory Riddle is running out of space to put airplanes. They're all flying around and they're close to proximity to each other. And there's no risk of a mid-air collision uh, in, in virtual reality. And Unless so- they're all and, stumbling around in the same room. Yeah, right. <laughs> they're cheaper to operate. Um, they, they don't use the same amount of fuel. And there was a long litany of things that, uh, that uh, the, um, uh, the uh, virtual reality at Emory Riddle made a huge difference in. And I think, I think uh, when you follow these things to their conclusion and you've got really good quality, uh, fidelity, uh, I think you're going to find that uh, it's going to change the way we do instruction in the future. One of the shifts in perception uh, that the aviation community has to make in order to really get the value out of virtual reality and uh, and flight training devices that they have the potential to give us in the community is we need to get past the idea that if the FAA doesn't let me log the time, I don't want to do it. Because the virtual reality and a, a number of the flight training devices um, are very effective, but the FAA 
I don't know how long it's going to take them to get around to giving any credit for the time you spend in virtual reality learning things, uh, if they ever do. But the point is that you learn a lot quicker with less stress uh, when an airplane and an instructor and the weather might not be suitable, might not be available with suitable weather. And so forget the fact that you can't log the flight time. You're still going to get done a lot quicker in terms of the hours that you're putting out good money for, and it's going to be much more effective and efficient. But we've got to get past the idea that if I can't log it towards my certificate or rating, I don't want to bother with Most it. Most significantly, I think instructors are going to want to be able to log time because they're wanting to fly in the airlines and and if they and they don't get to fly in an airplane they're not being, going to be excited well, about helicopter, right? we're, we're in, a, in an aircraft they're not going to be excited about virtual reality so we have to figure out how to get that's a hurdle we're going to have to get over right but the, the i think the point and and chris uh hill can probably uh, educate me more on this is that virtual reality is generally coupled with artificial intelligence with AI that will guide the learning pilot so that you don't necessarily have to have a flight instructor right there on the spot. Or they could work with a number of people rather than one-on-one -on -one in an aircraft. So we're going to have to figure out how we're going to handle the instruction part of it in terms of an instructor slant uh, right. guide or, uh, guidance. Scott, can uh, you add anything to this? Uh, no, I agree 100% with everything John and Martha talked about. Uh, one of the local schools here that just opened up next door at Falcon Field uh, just got one of the simulators that was actually uh, on display at, at the expo this year. Um, yeah, the chief flight instructor shared with me the, the, the memo that goes along with it, you know, showing the approvals. And uh, I'm quite honestly excited to go over and, and do my instrument proficiency, proficiency check in it. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it, it would be great if there were a way to somehow credit, uh, obviously not flight time, but credit a flight instructor and flight instructor with the time spent in a simulator like that. I agree with John 100%. Um, both parties need to want to use it. I can see the students wanting to use it early on. And then as they start looking at their flight hours and log books, they're gonna say, oh, I need to be logging this time. If we can break through that, like just, just been mentioned, uh, I think that tool can be used just wildly successfully. Well, one of the things we need to remember about virtual reality is the kids growing up today are doing it all the time in their games, in their gaming. And uh, they're turned on by it, they like it. And the more that we have things like that in the aviation community, the more likely we are to attract young people to the aviation community who are turned on about the state of technology and the excitement of this kind of uh, virtual reality programming. Um, I will say I just saw a comment pop up from Richard in the, uh, the chat feature that said that he's actually listening to our webinar today as he's flying virtual reality. So um, apparently you can uh, multitask uh, as you uh, are in the virtual reality machine. Um, we are right at the top of the hour. We've only got a couple more questions left. If you don't mind, we'll just go a little bit longer. Uh, from Mark, um, I learned a lot about what not to do and what and or what risks to look out for by reading NTSB reports. Would you recommend students uh, follow the NTSB reports? Uh, the Kings first. The NTSB reports um, uh, can be very dry. Um, there are, uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. They're, they're very detailed analyses. The, the biggest issue for me is that particularly if it's a significant accident that it comes out, report comes out about, it's like two years after the accident. So it's not a fresh memory where uh, the, the, the pilot is currently familiar with what happened. But there's a lot of uh, work in the aviation press uh, Peter Garrison with Flying Magazine and also AOPA and Plane and Pilot have columns where they uh, people talk about 
uh, accidents that happened, what uh, what was learned from them, um, and and what lessons uh, a pilot can take away to apply to their own flying. And those types of columns, I think, are extremely valuable. I think it's a good service that they, they do, that they provide. Yes. It's, it's um, um, NTSB does it uh, kind of like in a governmental sort of fashion, but they don't flesh it out in the same sort of way. Right. Scott, any, uh, anything to add? Uh, once again, I concur with everything Martha said. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to try and take that up, Scott. <laughs> I want to get some more free videos. No. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that, that uh, kind of occurred to me, and, and now that I think about this, it's actually uh, uh, got a little bit of, of, of history is, is when you're working with somebody that's maybe flying a particular aircraft or you're, or you're working with an aircraft owner, it is very beneficial that you can search the NTSB uh, you know, by a specific aircraft. And I think there's a lot of value in, in that specifically as well. So they can see what are some of the things that pilots who fly what I'm flying are getting into. That's a very good point, Scott. Uh, to get the information about your particular aircraft, if you own it or fly one type a lot, uh, tells you uh, a lot about where the potential traps are. For instance, in the uh, twin Cessna series, the, the fuel system is a bit complicated and it's very easy to accidentally pump your fuel overboard and end up with a lot less and than you think you uh, have. So, uh, and there's things like that that show up in those NTSB reports that are extremely valuable. Looks like uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, this might be more for the Kings because I think you probably have experienced this a bit more often. What do you do to help fixed wing pilots transition to rotor wing because of the negative transfer? Well, I think one of the things that, uh, that, that uh, inst uh, helicopter instructors can do is refrain from having start them start off by hover uh, uh, because it's something that, that a, a fixed wing pilot can't do. So what I like to do is take a, a, a fixed wing pilot and put them in a helicopter and have them cruise and then have them slow down a little bit and then have them speed up a little bit and have them slow down a little bit and coordinate the pedal with the uh, with the speed changes and the and the and the, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, collective changes and and so uh, just have them get used to picking up and slowing down and then I'll, I'll take someone. Uh, and, and slow them down to like 15 mile an hour. And, and, and they'll be going over a hill and over a, a, a dale and so on. And then I'll say, oh, wait, wait, what's that over there? And I said, well, let's take a look at that for a second. The guy will stop and look at it. And I'll say, oh, by the way, you're hovering. And they go, oh. <laughs> and then, then they aren't hovering anymore. Right. But the thing is, is that's something that they can do gradually if you just have trained the motor skills gradually as you go along. Um, if, but, if it's possible, I'm trying to make it sound like I know what I'm doing. I, I think it's valuable, if possible, uh, when you're transitioning from fixed wing to helicopter to have an instructor that has both certificate, certificates, both, uh, both categories. And the reason is uh, when we were learning to fly helicopters, our uh, instructor did not, uh, had never flown fixed wing. And we would be doing set downs out in the, the practice pad uh, at the airport. And John and I each inevitably, right as we got almost to touchdown, would start backing the helicopter up. And this guy would say, don't do that. Don't Why do are you that. backing Why up? Why are you backing <laughs> it up? Don't ever back it up. You can let him going going forward. We were pulling back but on the cycle. When, when, he, we're <laughs> when he didn't understand because he wasn't a fixed wing pilot is that what we were, our, our muscle memory was making us flare just before we touched. And the flare in the helicopter makes you, doesn't make you, you know, hover just above the ground. It makes you back up. And so, um, a, a, an instructor who is dual rated uh, would have some insight into the reason why a fixed wing pilot uh, is doing those things and would understand better 
uh, the, the kinds of negative transfer that the instructor and the learning pilot need to watch out for? Well, I, I think the key to it is make it fun for everybody and ask the fixed wing person learning to fly a helicopter to do something they can do and something they can't do. Don't start them off with things they can't do. Scott, is this area, uh, do you have any experience in uh, working with uh, fixed wing into rotary wing uh, transitions? Abs absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've uh, had the opportunity. I'm also a fixed wing CFI, uh, but transitioned many folks uh, on the added category uh, ratings. And uh, not to sound like a broken record, but I, I couldn't agree more with what's already been said. Um, taking somebody out to, to teach them to hover uh, as a fixed wing person isn't the best first task, uh, getting them out there flying what they are used to, that air sense, uh, just like John described is the key. Problem with our in flight instructor, why he did that is, first of all, Robinson had a complete syllabus and he just totally ignored it because he said, well, uh, you already know how to fly patterns, you know how to fly en route, you know how to talk to ATC, we don't need to work on those, we need to work on hovering. <laughs> so we did, and we did, and we did, and we did, and that's, it was something else again. I'm, I'm a big believer, this is the guy that I referred to needed to follow a syllabus. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that is where we learned how really important the syllabus. the syllabus was, deep down emotionally, not just academically. Okay, well, let's finish on a uh, lighter note. Um, I'm not sure where the question uh, came in from. What's your favorite helicopter? And Scott, we'll start with you this time. I would have to say it's probably what we lovingly call the Little Bird. Uh, the Hughes 500, MD 500. Uh, Boeing has the AH-6, uh, which, which I am so lucky to be able to, to fly. It includes the Special Operations MELB. Uh, it's, it's an absolute little race car. It's... Uh, I like everything about it. It's it's also a handful. You know, we've we've built it where uh, it's it's got a power plant, unlike the normal standard category aircraft. A couple extra rotor blades, and it really forces you to fly it carefully because that aircraft can put you in a corner that that you can't get out of. So, uh, how does the Hughes five hundred similar to that? Is the Hughes that? is the current Hughes five hundred similar to that? Uh, in looks it is, but the actual flight characteristics of the attack version that we've built, uh, just with the gross weights and the, and the added rotor blade and so on, really makes that aircraft uh, fun to fly. It's a challenge, not a challenge to overcome that, oh, look, I can fly this without crashing type thing, but uh, you've got to fly it smart, you've got to fly it right, and uh, that's really what I enjoy about it. Sounds John, like what about you? What about, what's your favorite helicopter? Uh, we had a friend that had a Bocal 105, uh, but it was, it was totally different kinds of feel of helicopters, a big, heavy uh, twin engine helicopter. You could, it was a camping machine and you, you go out in the desert and, and, uh, and uh, Scott, you probably have some observations on that 105. Yeah, I've got some friends that, that actually, uh, a friend that owns one right now, uh, I'm still waiting for my opportunity to go out, go fly it upside down with him. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay, Martha, we saved the best for last. What's your favorite helicopter? Well, uh, what we fly the most and really enjoy is the Robinson R22. And um, you know, we have uh, a number of friends who have um, biplanes they fly or cubs and stuff like that and and the r22 is our equivalent if you if you really want to get down and see the countryside and fly low and slow and just um, let you fly over the flowers right yeah <laughs> hover low over the flowers and take pictures um and and we we it's perfect for that we go over to the desert there's a a uh, hotel and restaurant over there that's cleared off a place and said, uh, well, it's not officially designated, but we call this our helicopter landing pad. And so we can fly over there for lunch in the R-22 and, and we do pretty often. It, it's just, it, it's really sporty and, and it's just a lot of fun to fly.
It's our idea of, of VFR aircraft. Uh, just, you know, we're not going to fly the IF, the, the uh, helicopter IFR, not that one anyway. And it's just, a, if you're going to go somewhere VFR today, that's the aircraft to go on. Okay, well, hey, let me uh, please express my gratitude for, to all three of you for your time today. I will say the comments have been loaded. I will try to share those with you via email. Um, people who've taken the courses, people who know you, Scott, and uh, support the, uh, the uh, honor of the Salute to Excellence Award. Um, John, Martha, Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm, I'm truly grateful. Thanks thank you. for your work on our behalf, Dan. Thank you very much. Okay, well, let me uh, share my screen and we will uh, wrap up our webinar for today. Uh, here we go. We do have another webinar coming up next week. We are grateful uh, if you take the time. Or, I'm sorry, we do not have a webinar coming up next week. Um, we uh, Apparently, April 28th is some sort of a chronological anomaly where we uh, could not find somebody who has the time to uh, join us next week to talk about any subject. Uh, just kind of funny. Who, uh, who knows how that happens sometimes. On May 5th, uh, we haven't exactly got the title down right, but we are looking at alternative fuels and what will be uh, coming up within the helicopter industry uh, in the very, very near future. It's one that I think that uh, everyone will enjoy. We do have a follow-up questionnaire that will be coming very shortly. We would appreciate it if you'll take uh, just a few minutes to let us know what you thought of the webinar today. Also, if you have any suggestions on upcoming webinars, uh, we're always looking for new topics, um, maybe even presenters that uh, could uh, fill in weeks that we don't uh, can't find people. Also, we're always interested in knowing what HAI can do for you uh, or what we could do differently or what we could do better. Um, if you have any thoughts on uh, the role that HAI has in the industry and how it affects you directly, we'd love to hear it. Best way to do that is send Jim Viola, our president and CEO, who is not able to be here today, a, a brief message. He uh, does see all the emails that come to president at rotor.org. He does assign them to task to, uh, to staff for tasking as necessary. Uh, please feel free to uh, submit a, a quick comment to Jim. He, uh, he does appreciate it. That does conclude our webinar today. We are grateful that you took time out of the, uh, your busy schedule to join us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Until two weeks from now, please be safe. Please fly safely.